And here I am saying yes to putting hormones in my body and it felt like I'd lost at something. You are weak. You are replacing your hormones. My next guest is someone who's channeled her honesty and openness into determination when it comes to making society more understanding about the struggles women face with menopause. From her documentary to her best-selling book, Davina McCall has used her platform to raise awareness about the bureaucracy and day-to-day -day struggles of going through these changes. And with the news that a year's supply of HRT will be available for just £20 with a prepayment voucher, uh, I'm very excited to say she joins me now to give me her thoughts on that and much else. Davina, absolutely thrilled to have you here on Times Radio. Uh, I, I guess we should start really with this news about HRT and the fact that it is now, you know, slightly more affordable, very much more affordable mm. uh, for women. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's amazing. Obviously, it's a fantastic thing. And it is funny that you and I were together there in October. What was it? Two years ago. Two years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, a year ago. No, no, it two was two. Years ago. Yeah. I mean, you that's see, we're quite menopausal mad, isn't it? women. That's no, why we can't what's remember. What's crazy is that, you know, it, we it went through two years ago, and that that is how long I've had literally women messaging me weekly saying, "When's it happening? When's it happening? What's going to happen?" Um, but I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth and say, "Oh, you know, well, it's a bit late, isn't it?" We are very pleased. It is a wonderful thing, and it will make a big difference to lots of women. However, what I do think is quite funny <laughs> is that. We've got this amazing thing where it will be a lot more affordable and make a big difference to women, but they can't get progesterone. And this is what's so frustrating. It's the shortages that are driving me absolutely mad. I think when you can see that demand is increasing incrementally month on month on month, surely it's economics, isn't it? Basic economics, supply should also increase. I don't know. And, and also, obviously, this government decision which now makes HRT more affordable is going to create uh, a much greater demand. demand. I mean, mm. one hopes, because, I mean, one of the things that... Um one of the things that I think remains incredibly contentious and, and, and women still don't really know what to believe about it is the whole discussion around HRT. Uh, did you start out with the same misconceptions, as it were, about it? I mean, I absolutely did. And um, I didn't, well, I didn't know what perimenopause was when I became perimenopause. I didn't even know it was a word. I'd never heard of it before. And um, I, I basically... When I did find out that I was perimenopausal, I was horrified, embarrassed, ashamed, and I was, I am absolutely not going on HRT. It will give me breast cancer after the 2002 WHI study came out with misinterpreted data that got released to the press, which made literally millions of women just throw away their hormone pills immediately. And um, it stuck in my mind. It's something that I actually remember reading about in the papers, and I thought, I'm never taking that stuff. That's terrible. And then I spoke to a gynaecologist who sort of told me that it would alleviate symptoms and that I was very low risk. I still felt there was a risk. But at that point, I thought, look, that risk is mitigated by the fact that I might have to leave my job. I love my job. I have spent 30 years trying to learn how to do the job the best that I can, and I'm going to have to leave it. I, I absolutely couldn't face doing that. And also my relationship with my children, who I seem to be screaming at all the time. And I, I just thought, look, this increased risk uh, is worth it. But I didn't tell anybody. I was super ashamed. I was really embarrassed. I didn't tell any of my friends. It was my little secret. But I came back. Me, I came back as a person. And my mission, really, in life has been to de-demonise HRT and uh, explain the truth to people because then I met a doctor who was a menopause specialist and I did a podcast with her and she explained that not only was there a, a very minor increased risk with synthetic HRT and everything's body identical now, um, but that there were also enormous health benefits to be had from that's taking it. And that's what I didn't know. I was like, what do you mean there are health benefits? I, what, I'm benefiting from this as well. But that's the thing that's so difficult to understand is why that message isn't a more, isn't, um, um, you know, more obvious, isn't handed out by more doctors. Uh, you know, that sort of positive messaging because there is so much medical background to making that statement. Well, I, I feel like um, there are organisations that... Um, are, don't like um, celebrities and politicians um, campaigning for women because 
they feel like we're not medical people. But really, all I'm doing is telling my experience, what I've learned from menopause specialists um, to be true. And there are thousands of menopause specialists and they all seem to be saying the same thing. So it must be true. But when... We're, we all want the same thing. All these organisations, the celebrities that talk about it, you, me, wonderful Lisa Snowden, all the, all the great women out there campaigning, we all want the same thing. We want to help women live their best lives in any way that they can. But in some way, slightly um, putting us down or ridiculing us for being celebrities and politicians and what do we know actually does women a disservice because we are the ones that can get out there and spread a message. We have following, we have a platform, you've got this station to talk to, you've got the Times, you know, it's, it's an amazing platform and we can help amplify the message. So rather than constantly just trying to slightly squish us, why don't we all come together and form a massive thunderclap? I it is interesting, isn't it, to hear the sort of sniffy voices uh, saying, you know, celebrity campaigning is, you know, naive and is putting, you know, all kinds of ideas in women's heads. It's almost like you've kind of gone round to talk to kindergarten <laughs> students, you know, putting ideas in people's heads. I mean, wh why do you think that we've got to this point in history? It's the 21st century and still the menopause is shrouded in mystery and mythology so much of it incredibly toxic and negative. Why are we in this place? Well, I think <clears throat> there is a lot of um, kind of ego in, in, in any area in life. And I feel like, you know, you, and I say it all the time, were campaigning for menopause. You did a documentary way before I did, and I always talk about that. I say that Lisa Snowden, she does this amazing live every Wednesday night. She's absolutely fantastic. Go watch her. It's not about trying to own something or I got there first or it, it, it's about a collaboration because we were talking about this the other night at the um, Wellbeing of Women event, um, event mm -hmm. which we went to, which was amazing where we were saying that the power of women helping other women, there's nothing like it because I tell you something, you go tell 10 women and they will tell 10 women because that's how we spread I think the that word. was one of the things that made me so joyous about the, the HRT announcement yesterday, despite the fact that it had been, you know, so delayed, um, was the fact that actually, as you said, you know, two years ago, a bunch of women got together, uh, Carolyn Harris uh, at, the, at the lead, Love the her. force of nature that, that she is, and said, you know, we've had enough of this, let's change the dynamic. You know, we set up menopause mandate. Well, I was just going to say, that was born of that moment, wasn't it? The it menopause was, mandate, by the way, if anybody's listening, you have to follow Instagram, come support and tell them your story. And that's another reason why I think this is so important because we've read the stories that women send in so about shocking. their menopause and it is gut-wrenching what women go through and this is what fires us on to keep trying to support women to have the best journey possible. I mean, the really interesting thing I think is, is that you're a woman, you know, you're not shy about expressing your opinions, uh, you're a vocal person, you seem a confident person and you've always been, or at least uh, after a, a, a bad start, shall we mm. say, always been particularly healthy and careful mm, mm. about uh, your health so the fact that you and and indeed I though not as healthy as you by any manner of means were sort of blindsided by menopause mm. is 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 quite shocking to me mm. what sort of symptoms did you have and and what did you think was going on you know did you think you were going crazy I think the first ones that seep in for or seeped in for me which I didn't even know were symptoms were a low level of um, dissatisfaction with life, like just a sort of dark, just... Uh, I'll tell you what it was. I, I hadn't belly laughed for years. I, I just, I couldn't remember the last time I'd really had hysterics. And I used to watch my daughters having hysterics. Yeah. I used to think, I really missed that. And then also, like, a weird anxiety. I am a gung-ho, chuck yourself out of a helicopter on a bungee rope type person. Off you and go. I, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> After you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but I, I suddenly was like, I don't want to drive to the supermarket at dusk in case I do my shopping and it's dark when I leave. Like, wh who, who's that? You know, and I was 43. 
and young. You know, this is young. And the difference is, somebody said to me the other day, oh, you know, but it's a natural thing. How come women for centuries have been doing it naturally? I said, no, centuries ago, they were dying at 43. Yeah, and so also, they didn't have to live through the menopause. And, and also, I think, you know, women have been suffering for centuries. Mm. It's not that they've got through it better or, you know, it, I think it's just that they've been suffering. You know, if, if you and I in the, mm. in the 21st century were embarrassed or ashamed about talking about menopause, just imagine what it was like, you know, 50 years ago, mm. let alone uh, 100 years ago. Uh, but, but do carry on because, I mean, that is the thing I think that's saddest in all of the stories that kind of get uploaded on Menopause Mandate is so many women feeling lost, alone, like they've lost themselves mm -hmm. and not understanding mm. why it is they're feeling that way and thinking they're to blame, you know, which is such a female impulse, isn't it? And also this, um, this kind of argument because I am a natural person right so I I don't drink alcohol I um, had home births um, I didn't have any drugs when I gave birth I uh, you yeah, know, I, I, yes <laughs> no but exactly like I am one of those sort of hippie type people um, and and here I am saying yes to putting hormones in my body and it felt like I'd lost at something you are weak you are replacing your hormones and when I came back having started HRT, I thought, wow, this is so mad that for three years I've been suffering in silence, unhappy, not a good mother, and yet I, I take thyroxine for my thyroid. What is the difference? If you are lacking in a hormone, what is the difference in replacing it? I'm not expecting it to keep me alive until I'm 102. I'm not expecting it to stop my skin from getting saggy or, you know, my knees from getting the little bit of creases over the top or my bingo wings or creases in my arms. You know, None of which she's no, got, but, quite frankly. I uh, study well, I her closely my... <laughs> in her lycra and um, no. But, my, you know, I am getting older, but I don't want to stay young. I don't, I don't want to... Um, pretend that I'm 30. I love being 55. You're not anti-aging. No, I'm really pro-aging. But I want to pro-age and feel okay. And f not just okay, I want to feel good. So I exercise, obviously, that's a huge part of it. But replacing my hormones is another. And when I found out the benefits for my bones, for my heart, for my brain, particularly because my dad had um, Alzheimer's, he passed away last year, I, I really feel like HRT is a very good option for me. And it might be for other women. I'm not saying it's right for all women. Many women do not agree with it. And there are lots of complications, especially around progesterone, that women kind of wrestle with but for lots of women it is an amazing thing that they are a bit frightened of and i want to kind of help them with that demystify and and make them feel better about doing it but you are as well one of the healthiest people i, th I think I've, I've, I've come across <laughs> and you're forever like setting off on triathlons <laughs> and as you said leaping out of playing you know just the whole thing um what is it that gives you your drive and your determination? Because some of the things that you've pursued are real struggles. Mm. And and I always think when I, when I look at you, you know, what an incredible survivor. You're so determined mm. and you've got so much energy. What do mm. you put it down to? I think it is from surviving. We were talking about this last night about how... Um, it's hard for kids who have been told all their lives that they are brilliant and they're absolutely fantastic and you're going to be the best at what you do and you're going to be amazing... I've always told my kids that life is really hard and it's a hard slog and enjoy the small wins. Because if you tell kids that everything is peachy and brilliant, they come out of university and they can't find a job and the first letter they write didn't get them the job, you're, you're doing them a disservice. We have to kind of really prepare kids for what life is like. It is difficult. But I think from being a drug addict when I was much younger... I am always grateful because life will never be that bad again. And my little wins mean possibly more to me because I could have been a street junkie. I could be dead by now. So I am I am always grateful for every little thing that I get. And I think, you know, that you talk about resilience and it's banded about as a sort of trendy word really nowadays. But um, resilience is built from hardship. And I always look at my children and I think whenever you go through a hardship, this will do you a favour later on in life. What gave you the wherewithal when you were young to mm. kick something that was such a mm. you know incredibly debilitating habit? 
interestingly, weirdly, I think because I was brought up by my grandmother and my grandmother was um, a very God-fearing woman. I went to church every Sunday. I was in the choir. I, uh, we had no money, but uh, lots of love and faith and solid morals. And then I'd go to Paris in the holidays and I'd be clubbing at 12, looking like a Lolita, smoking joints, taking drugs with my mum. Like, it was, ma it was carnage. <laughs> so I had these two worlds that I could never tell about each other. I would never let them collide. And I just sort of lived both of those lives. But it was my granny's influence that really saved me in the end. And my best friend shut me in a car and she said, look, I know you've been lying to me. I know... You know her, actually, Sarah Hiscox. Oh, yes. And um, she, when we were nine, uh, 24, she shut me in the car and she said, I was going to take you to a concert, but actually I'm not going to. I'm going to tell you some home truths. Anyway, we had a huge fight. She said, everybody's talking about you and what an absolute car crash you are. And I was like, what? And I was so horrified because I'd always thought nobody knows. I wear lots of makeup. I've got two jobs. I'm, like, you know, working. I don't steal. I'm... You know, I haven't got enough money. I've got to it together. I haven't got enough money to put petrol in my car, but I've got a car. Um, I am together, but I kept nodding out of dinners. I kept. I mean, I wasn't turning up on time. I wasn't. I was letting everybody down. And after that, when she said that, I went. I, well, I told her something very rude, and I left the car and I walked away. And as I was walking away, I thought, "Don't look back," and I burst into tears. And I sat inside and I cried all night. And then in the morning, I call, called somebody called Mary from um, Narcotics Anonymous, and I said, please, can I come to a meeting? And I went to a meeting that night. So it must have been particularly scary for you to then find yourself, what, 20, 20 years mm. later, again, feeling... Hot sweat. ...some of the, yes. the, the things that you must have felt yes. when, you were, when you were giving up drugs and, and, and not knowing how that was happening to you or why that was happening to you. I didn't you. even know that night sweats were a symptom. I th I heard about I'd heard about hot flushes, people fanning themselves, but because nobody talked about symptoms, I didn't know that waking up in a pool of sweat on a bed, and I just thought, well, I must be ill. But then I seemed to be ill every month, and now it wasn't constant. That's the thing about symptoms with perimenopause. You must understand that they come and go. So because your hormones are coming and going. So it means that you get these weird symptoms very sporadically. So, yes, it was absolutely horrible, and it did take me back to those days. And, again, I didn't talk to anybody about it because I was frightened and I wasn't sure what was happening. When I did talk to a GP, um, he sort of thought that I was too young and said, no, it's not that, you're, you're too young, because I was 43 at the time. And you were doing, like, live television, big yeah. events. You yeah, know, that forgetting required people's you names. I mean, I had terrible brain fog, awful, awful brain fog. And I always loved the fact that I was quite sharp. Um, I was good at recalling information. I'd spent 20 years honing a sort of TV memory where you can remember something for an hour and then forget it. <laughs> oh, yes. um, and I, I just had lost the ability to do that. I was looking at Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen and thinking, I know who you are. I said your name three minutes ago and I, I can't remember your name. And I was thinking, Luh. and I just started pointing at him going, you, you're thinking <laughs> it'll, come back to, it'll come back to me. Yeah, you with your amazing hair, like making a joke out of it or something. But even the producer said to me afterwards, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine, fine, fine. Because she'd noticed. Now, today, if a producer had said to me, are you okay? And it was a woman, I'd have said, actually, do you know what? I've, I've got a couple of perimenopausal symptoms. Tomorrow when we do the show, is there any way that when I'm looking at somebody, could you just feed their name into my ear? That's giving me a strategy to help me out. But I couldn't talk to anybody because I was so ashamed. And you are, in a way, an example of so many of the stories uh, that we've both read on, on Menopause Mandate. Mm. And, of course, uh, like me, you know, you'll end up with a lot of people just getting in touch with you directly mm. or on mm. social media or whatever. You're, you're, you're an example of someone who's been resilient enough to be able to withstand it and actually speak out. You had mm. a platform and, and you've used it. But... For many, many women across the country, trying to go about their their jobs is a really, really difficult struggle. And I thought the interesting thing about being at that Wellbeing of Women event the other night that we both attended was the number of men in the audience. And I wondered about your thoughts about men joining in. I've had on, so on this many because, messages you know, from guys people there will that think, night. People will think, oh, mm. this is a sort of... Perhaps people might think this is an alienating conversation because it's two women sitting banging mm. on about menopause. But actually, it's an issue that affects the whole of society, not just women of a certain age, isn't it? <sighs> I've got a really nice story to tell you. So I was on Twitter about um, three weeks after my book came out and I got a message from a chap and he said, um, bought your book, Davina. 
went to the living room, threw it in onto the sofa, closed the door and ran away. <laughs> <laughs> and I direct messaged him back because he followed me. And I said, hey, mate, I said... I didn't retweet your message because I didn't want people to dump on you because I thought they might give you a hard time. But actually, are you struggling? Is everything all right? And he sent a message back saying, oh, I'm, thanks so much for getting in touch. I am struggling a bit. I don't know what to say or what to do. And I'm worried that if I say something, she's going to bite my head off. And But she's gone. She's, like, disappeared, and I don't know what to do. And He's I thought, oh, his, here's his a partner, guy. Obviously. Yeah, here's mm. a guy who loves his partner. He's bought her a book, but he's so terrified. I said, look, can I give you a piece of advice? Would that be all right? And he said, yes, yeah, sure, I'll take anything I can get. I said, why don't you go in to the living room, pick up the book and say, look, I, I, I can see you're struggling. I really want to help you. Shall we read some of this book together? And I, I want to learn about it and I want to help you and, and see how that works. Anyway, he messaged me the next morning and he said, oh, my God, Davina, it was the best. We sat down and we talked. And so it, it is scary for partners of women going through perimenopause because you don't know what to do or what to say or how to say it. It's a bit like when a girl has a period. You know, you don't say to somebody if they're having a bad day, are you on your period? Because they will Bite get you. really annoyed, yeah. you know. But this is slightly different. This is You are vulnerable when you're perimenopausal. You are a bit frightened. You don't know what's happening. You feel invisible. You feel like you don't count for anything anymore. And I can't understand, and I don't know why that happens, but I felt invisible. I felt unseen. I felt unattractive. I felt um, unimportant, insignificant. And to be seen by your partner and say, I've got your back, we, you know, don't worry, we can do this together and get some support and have someone to talk to about it. I spend my life waking up in the morning and going, Michael, um, Michael, my partner, uh, Michael, do you know what? Testosterone. It's such an interesting... It's like, <laughs> you know, talk it through, talk it through. He knows more about menopause than any man should. But what he's done is taken that information, he's a hairstylist, and he's using it to help women losing thin with thinning hair losing their hair you know and he's working with a trichologist i mean it's so lovely when you help men they want to go and help women and that is i mean ultimately the thing because so many conversations about menopause are gloomy for obvious reasons mm. because there's still so much that that needs to be achieved but ultimately as a, as a woman i mean both of us are really we're we're sort of almost past mm. menopause mm. We're, we're both in in public facing jobs where mm. it's very easy to feel overlooked at this particular period in time um and that's something that i i guess you've also sort of had to do battle with in terms of summoning reserves of, of confidence that, that you didn't know you had but but when you come through the other side um i guess a lot like 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 giving up drugs you know the, the, this this the sunny uplands really do exist don't well they? i i um i said in the book because the um chinese use the term second spring i love that yeah because it's not an autumn it's not a winter it really is a second spring. There is a feeling of um, release when you realise that you can't have children anymore. Um, when you can have children, there's always, should I, should I, maybe I shouldn't, should I, should I, should I, shouldn't I? When you think, I can't, it's like, oh, great, like, now what do I do? Um, your children possibly are a bit older. Um, you can maybe go out a little bit in the evenings and not worry about babysitters and what time to get back for. You can... I mean, now that I've got my hormones adjusted and in check and I'm on HRT and all my balances are correct, I really can't tell you how happy I feel because I think, but potentially because I was quite a messed-up teenager, I did spend most of my 20s and 30s, you know, in therapy or meetings trying to untangle the spaghetti of my brain and now that I have some clarity and I love myself warts and all you know I am not perfect there are sides of my character that I don't like but I know about them when I act out on those I can apologize I can do better um and I I feel happy with myself I can't say that that ever I ever felt like that before menopause perimenopause ever yeah, so and that's something to look forward to, people. Midlife is and not also, all bad. And also, I've got to say one more thing, mm. that the other reason why I got into this, like... Um, campaigning. Campaigning side of things was because I wanted to reframe the way that society views menopausal women. You're smashing it. Like, 
Carolyn Harris is smashing it. You know, I'm smashing it. Lisa's smashing it. Ev everybody, all the doctors out there are smashing it. Like, menopausal women, perimenopausal menopausal women are at the top of their game. Let's not forget that. And we've got a lot more to offer. <laughs> Almost a sense of foreboding there, yes. perhaps. Yes. Uh, Davina McCall, thank you so much Thanks for joining for me. Thanks for having me on, Mariella.